Last time on Dragon Ball Z, we officially hit our Shippuden arc as the narrator revealed the goings on since Son Goku's heroic sacrifice and Gohan's final eradication of the terror that was Cell. The world entered an age of relative peace, with the most pressing conflicts being those committed by card carrying members of Jobber Nation looking to make a quick buck for themselves on what is now Satan City, named after the world's strongest martial artist who was cataloged in the history books as being the one who took down Super Perfect Green. Gohan was grown and is now a 16 year old city girl living in in a lonely world and looking to take the midnight train going to Satan City, specifically to attend Orange Star High School and assimilate into the life of a student just as he and his mother had hoped for all these years. But Gohan couldn't help himself from the heroics just a bit, and his antics stopping petty theft and crime in the city led him to crossing paths with Videl, just a city boy born and raised in South Detroit whom also just so happened to be taking the midnight train to Orange Star High School, and for a time, these two were just strangers waiting, searching up and down the boulevard for the dash shadows lurking in the night. But fate may have other plans for these two, and who knows, maybe one day with just a simple smile they'll be able to share the night. But for now, our story goes on. The day begins with Son Gohan getting ready to work hard to get his fill, because you already know that these rap scallions of Satan City are constantly looking for a thrill, and only a true savior of justice is up for that task. Hitting a quick hinge in the go go, Gohan dials up his Kim Possible communicator and dons his great Saiyan Man moniker. Prepared to head to school incognito mode, no longer worried about being revealed as the mild mannered Son Gohan with such a foolproof disguise going. With his younger brother Son Goten gassing him up, and his mom just happy to see her little boy smiling so much, Sandman heads to school and leaves the Nimbus in the hands of his younger brother son Goten, officially passing the torch. Upon Gohan's arrival at school, the anime gives us a pretty hilarious filler episode where Gohan believes his identity is discovered after a female classmate on the rooftop peeps him transforming and tells him that she knows his secret and will 6-9 the information expeditiously unless Gohan agrees to be her boo thing and take her out. For the next 17 minutes, we're treated to Son Gohan's slice of life bliss as we watch the obsessed Angela, as she is known in the dub, fiending over my man Son Gohan something dangerous. As Gohan attempts to come to grips with the fact that he's being blackmailed into spending time with this lady, his mom starts telling stories about how his pops rips her up by her explaining what a date is, and how a boy should do whatever he thinks the most enjoyable thing he can do with a girl is when taking her out. Y'all already know, because his son Goku we're talking about here, the first thing this man did was throw a punch at his would-be wife, and the two spent the rest of the evening scrapping. Following Chi Chi's uncontrollable panty melon session, the episode continues with Gohan taking old Angie out for a movie while he falls asleep in the middle of a popcorn bucket handy session. Tragedy strikes. And as Gohan, excuse me, Great Saiyan Man and Videl work together to save civilians from a burning building, the episode ends when it appears that Angela is about to let Gohan's cat out of the bag and inform Videl of her classmate's alter ego. But what actually occurs are grade A Toriyama shenanigans when it's revealed that Angie is more blind than the refs at a New England. Patriot home game and tells Videl that Gohan's secret is that he wears teddy bear undies. Oh, cholera. Czy to Freddy Fazbear? Exposing her peeping Tom behavior, catching Gohan changing clothes in the school some weeks back. When Gohan asks about the day before and what she saw on the rooftop, Angie tells Gohan she couldn't see Squat up there because she wasn't wearing her contacts and wonders why his creepy ass will be on the roof with no pants on anyway. Gohan's lack of attentiveness and potential status as a predator. Did you take a seat right over there? What was on the agenda tonight? I was, honestly, I was just gonna take her out and show her around. Take her out and show her around where? My teddy bear underwear. Puts a nail in the coffin in his relationship with Angela, whom he is sure must be bad written at home considering the way he treated her on their date. The episode ends when Gohan gets his first lesson in the hellscape that is modern dating, as good old Angie is seen pushing up on some random at school, cooking up poor Gohan for being a simp and wearing toddler undies while Gohan's brain malfunctions and makes a note to get the link to those Sigma male podcast playlists from Vegeta. Shortly after this, as Gohan returns from his tender misadventures, he returns to a seat to find Videl leaving class as a lecture begins following a call from the mayor of Townsville, that there is crime afoot in the city and only the strongest power puff Girls prepared to take on the job. Gohan looks on in confusion, understandably confused as to why the feds are ringing up a single high school girl to take on crime in the city as to oppose, you know, doing their damn job and holding down the fort themselves. Base wife will erase her and the homie sharpener inform him not to be fooled by Videl's small frame. She's extremely powerful. Some even say more powerful than her pops, the omnipotent savior, Mr. Satan himself. 
Because of this, local police hand off their dirty work to her when a job is out of their pay grade, meaning she has to leave school a lot. Gohan takes this in and tries his best to relax and continue listening to the lecture as usual. But the homie eventually loses his battle to the white knight within him, asks the teacher if he can be excused to go deal with his explosive diarrhea, and Hinches and the captain save a hole to go provide some backup to the local vigilante. The scene then cuts to Videl standing ten toes down with some cuffs, encouraging Nick Fury and Usopp to put down their rocket propel grenades to come along quietly and no one will have to get hurt. Usopp puts the leader of the operation onto the fact that this feisty pigtail princess standing in front of him is none other than Videl, the daughter of Hercule Satan, and she is known to have nukes hiding under those fingerless gloves, so they might want to move with some caution. Nick Fury scoffs at the idea of backing down, flexing as he moves towards the young girl, encouraging his homie to look at his physique and warning Videl that he's seen enough doujin to know where this is going and that a pretty young thing like her should learn to stay out of grown people's business. Before he can yoke her up and proceed forward with the bad end, however, Videl takes to the air and kicks Buddy straight in the chin, revealing Nappa Light's chrome dome for the world to see and helping him realize that the difficulty of this encounter may be a bit higher than he initially thought. Man then goes full shown in protag mode and is like, alright, now it's time to get serious, before proceeding to get molly whopped up and down the highway in absolutely embarrassing fashion. I mean, she's just chalking this man, while his homie peeps the whole affair on the sideline and prepares the blicky so they can end this thing prano. Ideally, before having to explain to the homies back home how they have to eat their meals through a straw after an encounter with a single high school girl. This is when Captain Suck Ass makes his heroic appearance, showing off his demonic grip strength by grabbing the criminal's gun squeezing it and turning it into scrap in a matter of seconds. And it's at this point that despite the ridiculousness of the fit and the unintentional hilarity of the theatrics, everybody present knew that whoever this great tire man bozo is, he meant business. And one thing I want to comment on real quick is just how unserious at least the beginning of the Majin Buu arc is compared to nearly everything we have in Z. As nutty as it could get at times, and Kami knows it could, Z by and large took itself and its melodrama pretty damn seriously. And I don't see this as a bad thing whatsoever, it just makes the change in tone here in this new arc of the story so much more noticeable. For lack of a better word for it, this Boku no Gohan experience we're getting right now following the Cell Saga is absolutely wacky. It's full of hijinks, has much more comedic tone, and even a number of fourth wall breaks that you would absolutely not see in Z unless it was a filler episode where the team decided to go ham on some of the creative liberties. The whole thing is much closer in tone than the original Dragon Ball, and you can almost feel the fun Toriyama was having coming through the page as well as the sense of relief he was experiencing and getting back, at least for a while, to the more whimsical and adventurous tone he was originally known for. And that's something that I feel he anchored onto throughout the entirety of the Boo Saga. Even though it definitely returns to the fight field, transformation laden and shown in spiciness the series become known for, it feels as though Toriyama felt much more comfortable with taking things less seriously this go around, even with the stakes being so high, and keeping humor as a cornerstone throughout the totality of the arc. I've seen some people describe the Boo Saga as a step below previous sagas or even unnecessary, and I'm sure it is an opinion I've regurgitated at some point in the past too. But having done this rewatch, I feel there's so much to love about this arc of the series, and in many ways it's Toriyama at his most true to form. Now after seeing Kamen Rider Green turn his pistol back into alchemic dust like Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet, the would-be criminal can't help but ask just who the hell this wag job is. And this is exactly the moment this menace Gohan has been waiting for, as Big Man lets out a devious smirk and with zero shame begins the sturdiest hand boning session of all time. Ham boning. Taking literally two pages of choreography in the manga before he finally, through exasperated breath, explains that he is the great Saiyan man and that resistance is futile. Upon seeing this, any moisture Videl has been experiencing dried up faster than a reheated chicken cutlet. And then the criminal, certain his rep in the underworld would be dealt a mortal blow if he allowed himself to be caught by this asshole of all people, got on his Naruto timing, threw a smoke bomb, and proceeded to commit the race through the nearest highway. For any normal vigilante, this may have proven a problem, but the great Sega man is nothing if not full of surprises. And in moments takes flight to the air, hammer blows a goon on the top of the head and brings him back to Satan's daughter without much ado. Upon returning, Videl thanks the not so mysterious hero for his assistance, and in an act of Death Note level 4D chess, leaves him with just a quick question before allowing him on his way, asking Gohan how he managed to get out of the classroom since they were in the middle of a lecture while all this was going on. Gohan proudly exclaims that it was actually pretty easy, telling her that he told the teacher he needed a quick bathroom break and that he actually needs to be heading back soon. Like Yagami, this man is not. Oh, here we go! 
I'm the man with the plan to uplift the good and root out the bad till we're living like we should. Hiya! Now you understand that I'm the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great Say Man! That's when old Phoenix right here lets out a big fat of Objection! and verifies that she knew this lame ass here was actually Gohan and she could smell it a mile away. After coming to grips with just how much of a rube he is, Gohan begs Videl not to spill the beans about his poorly disguised identity, discussing how his goal is to just live a normal life, and if the public finds out they got a Kryptonian living among them, things will undoubtedly get quite a bit crazier both for himself and his loved ones. Videl ponders Gohan's proposal, and instead hits him with a counteroffer, agreeing to continue going along with his great Saiyan man ruse as long as he agrees to be a part of the next Tenkaichi Budokai coming up. Videl shares a brief history of the tournament, and also how strangely enough, the previous champ just so happens to share the same family name as Gohan. Growing increasingly more terrified of Videl's Facebook detective work, Gohan slowly begins to realize his options are narrowing as Videl continues, stating that a match between the two former champ's kids is sure to get the crowd going. But if he should refuse, she can't be held liable for what the public may learn about the true identity of the great Pepsi man. Reluctantly realizing he's in checkmate, Gohan agrees with Videl's demands and states that he'll sign up for the tournament, and will also provide Videl with lessons on how to fly, another demand she devilishly snuck in before dropping the boy wonder back off at school. As Gohan returns to class and gets ruthlessly cooked up by the instructor and his classmates for the cheek busting experience he must have had keeping him in the bathroom for that length of time, the young hero slowly begins to understand that civilian life might be more complicated than he naively imagined just chilling back in the mountains with mom. And it's right about here that one really starts to get the feeling that the winds of change are coming over our peaceful slice of life existence with our boy son Gohan. Following the Videl fiasco and getting cooked up by his classmates in school, Gohan returns to Bulma licking his wounds, informing her about the blackmail job and how he'll be in need of another disguise that meets the Budokai's regulations. That's when this man's son Gohan dons one of the most out of pocket fits of all time. Keeping his green and black onesie fit he borrowed from Android 16's closet and accessorizing with a pair of Gucci sunglasses and a bleach white do-rag that he had to have borrowed from Mr. Popo's crib because there's no other explanation for it. Was my man Gohan out here trying to join the swim team? The fit is just egregious, bro. Gohan really don't got anybody that love him out here for real, or else they would have died before letting him come out like this. After getting side-eyed by Young Trunks for the fit violation, who else but the prince of all games should come out the woodwork wearing a tank top at least two sizes too small and eagerly waiting to inform the young warrior that if he's entering, the prince will be as well. And while he may have been the alpha dog seven years ago, something about that do-rag is telling him the tier list may have been amended since that time. Then, in an act that can only be described as mob hysteria, the crew hears another voice stating that they'll be entering the tournament too. Team 4 Star had it right on the money, because the way Vegeta was looking around in fight or flight lets me know little homie thought the intrusive thoughts had finally won. But to everyone's shock, they hadn't all lost their collective marbles quite yet, and indeed was Son Goku calling in from King Kai Zoom Premium to let them know that he was cashing in his one day Cedar Point Pass from on high to crash the Budokai and collect the bag. For the first time in seven years, Vegeta's erectile dysfunction wasn't a problem, and as he went to the wardrobe for a clean set of trousers, Gohan made his way to each of his homies' domiciles to put the word back out in the street that daddy was coming back, and he'd be making a special appearance at the World Martial Arts Tournament. First, Gohan pulls up on the Kame house and goes complete gag manga mode, breaking the fourth wall to explain why this man Krillin has a full ass head of hair and there's a little girl on the island calling him daddy. Despite the slander, Krillin was not name dropped in the Epstein court documents, rather he had secured the Android 18 bag and even more deviously named his firstborn daughter after one of his exes on some absolute demon time behavior. Let all questions and accusations of Big Krill not having that dog in him be laid to rest. After dropping the news that daddy was coming home, Gohan also informed them of the tournament and hearing about the prize money, 18 ears perked up real quick. And all but Vaughn told Krill they'd be entering the running as well. And y'all already know Drip got Big Krill has something to say about Gohan's cape and do-rag combo. There was no way that boy was leaving the island without Unk saying something. With the self-esteem in further disarray, Gohan's next stop was to look out where he got Dende, Popo, and Big Green up to speed on the happenings. Never being one to threaten with a good time, Big Green adjusted the turban and declared that he'd be making an appearance at the Buddha Kai as well, and encouraged his stepson to do something about that do-rag before his request becomes a demand. 
with the most pertinent of the Z Warriors notified, Gohan made his way back home to inform his mom of his father's conjugal visit date coming up at the tournament. Which Chi Chi was more than ecstatic about because they were once again almost destitute and Gohan taking the dub will seal their family's rags the richest story for some time to come. And right here is where those winds of change in the story I was talking about really get set into motion. The moment Big Poppy Goku got reintroduced into the mix, you can tell they were about to start heading into a different direction with the story. And while I would be lying if I said there wasn't a certain electricity in the air at his reintroduction as well as the upcoming training arcs, it's also true that there's a bit of sadness seeing the slice of life Gohan era come to an end as the changing of the guard looms on the horizon. Me Ryan aside, Toriyama is one of the most interesting storytellers I've ever read about in the sense that his ability to go with the flow of a story and have events be spurred on by characters rather than pre canceled set pieces in his mind is something that few are able to do and even while acknowledging the imperfections in the plot holes the man's ability to craft a layered and interesting narrative purely off the back of his own creativity and craft an entire volumes worth the coherent story on a week-to-week -week basis is nothing short of madness i'm gonna stop myself for now but next time i want to share with y'all some of the excerpts from translated interviews i read with toriyama about the boo saga and how his likes dislikes and burnout came to heavily shape the direction the series would veer into Tune in next time, y'all. As Son Gohan works to get back into fighting shape and prepare for the upcoming Tenkaichi Budokai. Seven years ago, Son Gohan was recognized as the undisputed top dog. Does the young warrior still hold that title, or does the new generation of Saiyan hybrids have a little more to say on the matter? Be easy, y'all, and catch you again in the next video.